Well, this is part two of season eight, episode eight, where we're going to go back to Culloden uh, Battlefield and let you see the whole presentation. I think it's about 20 minutes long, so come along for a ride. If you're into history, this is a great history lesson of Scotland and the Jacobites. Okay, my name's Gregor. I'm part of the engagement team here at Culloden. I'm going to take us out onto the battlefield today for around 40 minutes. A uh, couple little safety points before we go. We're going to be on these gravel paths the whole way. They are nice paths, but please do still watch your footing. Don't want anyone particularly falling over today if we can help it. If you need to come back here at any time for any reason, please do just come back along those paths and you'll find yourself back here at the visitor center. You'll need to head in the front doors though. These back doors are set to exit only, so they won't open for you, no matter how much you push, knock, bang, wave. If you try it, please don't do it. Um, it is the height of summer, which means it's the height of tick season here in Scotland. Please do try and avoid going in the long grass if you can help it. You really do not want to be b b bitten by a tick today if we can help it. A wee bit of history, some of the context before we get going. I'm going to start with a man called James the Sixth and First. He's got two numbers after his name because he's the king of two places at the same time. He is James the Sixth of Scotland, and then in 1603, England basically runs out of kings and queens, and they ask very nicely if James will go down and be their king. He says yes, goes down the road, James the First of England, hence the two numbers. After James, it will be his son who takes the throne, and this is Charles the First. We're largely going to skip over Charles because a man called Oliver Cromwell comes along, chops his head off, and makes a republic for a few years. After Charles I, his son will restore the monarchy for the Stuarts. This is Charles II. He restores it, restores it for the Stuart family. The Stuarts, they are the ancient kings and queens of Scotland going back centuries. After Charles II, it will be his brother who takes the throne. And this is where things start getting really quite interesting for us. His brother is James VII and II. This James is a Catholic. Parliament, they say, it's okay that you're Catholic, James just so long as you don't have a Catholic son and heir. So, James doesn't do that. He has two Protestant daughters, everything's going well for him, he's happy, Parliament's happy, and he will remarry and have a son. Parliament, they're no longer happy with James, and they say, we told you you can't do that, you are deposed. Kicked off the throne in 1688. He's kicked off the throne in favour of his eldest daughter, who is Queen Mary, and she's married to William of Orange, William of the Netherlands. They come across from the Netherlands in either an invasion or the Glorious Revolution, it really does depend who you ask here, and they'll rule together as William and Mary. Mary dies quite young unfortunately though, so William will then rule on his own until he's out for a wee wander, trips over a molehill and breaks his neck. Mm. They don't have kids though, so the throne it passes to Mary's younger sister. Here comes Queen Anne. Anne has 17 pregnancies, and not a single one makes it to adulthood. Mm. What does happen in her reign, though, is a little thing called the Act of Union in 1707. This act, it means we're no longer dealing with England and Scotland. We're now dealing with one kingdom called Great Britain. Anne does die without kids, though, and the throne, it can't pass to her younger brother. Her younger brother is the one who's caused all these issues just by being born. So Parliament, they decide it's going to jump over 50 lines of succession to a woman called Sophia of the Palatinate. She's a German... But she is a Stuart. She's married to the Elector of Hanover, but she'll die before she can take the throne. The throne, it will therefore pass to her son, who is then George I of Great Britain, our first Hanoverian king. After George I, his son will take the throne, the imaginatively named George II. George II, he will be king in 1745 and 46 when we have the battle that takes place here at Culloden. Now, the youngest son, probably favourite son of George II, was Prince William Augustus, the Duke of Cumberland. He is going to be the man who leads the government forces here at the Battle of Culloden, fighting for his dad. Back in the other side of the family, with all the Jameses and the Charleses, James VII and II is a little bit annoyed when he gets kicked off the throne. So we'll have our first Jacobite rising in 1689. This rising will fail. James, he tries to take the throne back, doesn't succeed, goes back to France where he will then live the rest of his life. His son will then take up the mantle for the Stuart family. His son would have been James VIII and III had he ever been king, as we know he wasn't. Instead, he is known as James Francis Edward Stuart or the Old Pretender. He's going to try twice, 1715 and 1719. 
but both of his risings are both also going to fail. He does like his dad, he retires to Europe and he has his own son. His son is Charles Edward Stuart, more commonly known nowadays as the Young Pretender or Bonnie Prince Charlie. He is going to be the one who leads the 1745, the fourth and final Jacobite Rising that ends here at the Battle of Culloden. A little point of note here, the word Jacobite, it actually comes from Latin. The Latin for James is Jacobus, so a supporter of James is a Jacobite. The people fighting here for the Jacobites of Culloden, they're not fighting for Charles. Yes, he's their leader here, but they're fighting to put Charles' dad, James, on the throne of Britain. Hence why they are Jacobites. We're going to head onto the battlefield itself now. There, we're going to find out all about the 45 Rising. He's decided it's his turn to try and take back the throne of Britain for his dad. He sets off from France with two ships, a nice big warship and a little frigate. They'll get to Cornwall, down on the southwest coast of England, and they encounter a Royal Navy warship. That would probably be all well and good they don't know Charles is on the ship, except for the fact that Britain and France are at war. The British, they see a French warship, they open fire. The Royal Navy, the French warship, the two of them, they're going to tear chunks out of each other. As a general rule here, ships don't sail too well when they're full of holes. And so they both turn around and return to their home ports in order to repair. The frigate, it escapes though and it sneaks up the west coast of the country and it'll land in the western isles of Scotland at Eriskay. They'll then cross over the sea to the mainland where they will land at Moidart. This is where Charles gets off the ship with his massive army of seven men. <laughs> the big army he planned on bringing, it was on board the warship that had turned around and gone back to France. No worries, he thinks, I'd always planned on building myself an army here in Britain, so he goes to Glen Finnan, probably more famous nowadays for its rather large viaduct that Harry Potter drives a car over, but no, back then this is where he raises the Jacobite standard, the standard, the flag of his dad. It goes up and 1500 Highland Jacobites rally around Charles. That's not that many. The Highlands, they could field 30 to 40,000 fighting men at this point. Only getting 1,500 isn't the best of starts. Again though, Charles isn't worried. He knows not everyone's going to meet him in Glenfinnan. He's going to pick people up on the way. So he starts marching south, and by September 1745, they reach Edinburgh. Now, they pretty much take the city without a fuss here, because the defenders forget to close the gates. They take the city, and then just a few days later, we'll have our first battle out to the east of the city at Preston Pans. This battle is a victory for the Jacobites. Their tactics work, their leadership works, and a lot of people decide that now is the time to start supporting them, because clearly they actually know what they're doing. The Jacobite numbers, they are going to swell over 10,000 at this point. They keep marching south, and by December, they reach Derby, just 125 miles to the north of London. That's where the Jacobites are going to stop, though. They stop, and Charles, he calls a war council. He gathers all of his generals and leaders around him, and says, what should we do next? They say, Charles, we should turn around and we should go home. <laughs> so that's what the Jacobites do. They're acting under the presumption that they are surrounded by three government armies, two to the north of them and one much larger to the south. That army to the south of them did not exist. The story goes, a government spy had basically infiltrated the Jacobites, heard a rumour, expanded the rumour from just a couple of people in front of them to an entire army. The Jacobites, they believed this and instead of marching potentially straight into London, taking the city, they turn around, they come back up here to sunny Scotland. On the way north, we do have another battle around halfway between Edinburgh and Glasgow at Falkirk. This battle is once again a victory for the Jacobites. They use different tactics, but they work just as well. It's a victory, they keep marching north, and they will spend a lot of their winter at a place called Culloden. Culloden itself, it's actually a few miles down the hill, it's a wee village. Where we are stood now is Culloden Moor, the moor to the south of that village. Culloden, it's based around Culloden House, the big country home in the area. It's nice, it has things like a roof and walls, and that's where Charles is going to spend a lot of his winter. The rest of his troops, they're not so lucky, they get to stay outside in the snow. No worries though, we get to April 1746 and it's time to start fighting again. So, on the 15th of April, the Jacobites, they will line up to our east, ready for a battle. Now, they're going to wait there all day though, because the government, 
They have met up with the Duke of Cumberland all the way out on the east coast of Scotland in Aberdeen. They train there for several weeks and then they march all the way to Nairn. Nairn is just 12 miles to our east here. That's where the government army stopped though. They stopped because the 15th of April 1746 was the Duke of Cumberland's 25th birthday. <laughs> He would much rather have a party than fight a battle, so he gives every single man an extra ration of cheese and an extra ration of brandy. They're going to stay the night in Nairn. The Jacobites, although they're a wee bit cold standing here, they're not dismayed. They decide they're going to try and throw a nice surprise party for the Duke in Nairn, by which they're going to try and attack him. They set off on what's now called the Night March. Now, they can't use the main road here because it is the main road. People would see them coming along it, and they cannot use torches. This big forestry block that we see there, it was not there at the time. You can see all the way down into the Murray Firth. And from there, two government warships, they can see all the way back up here to Culloden. They'd see the line of torches, they'd send out the signal, the surprise would be ruined, what's the point? And so the Jacobites, they are going to go cross country in the pitch darkness. I might have been okay if this was still a Highland Jacobite army, but by this point, it's not. Yes, there are Highland Scots in the army, but there's also Lowland Scots, Englishmen, Irishmen, Welshmen, Frenchmen, some Danes, and even a single Spaniard. A lot of them are not very good at dealing with the Scottish conditions. So they will make it 10 of the 12 miles to Nairn before they realise they've lost half of their army. You can't attack with such a small force, so they decide to turn around and come back here to Culloden in order to regroup. Unfortunately for them, they don't notice on the march back that they march past the other half of the army, <laughs> who themselves will make it 10 of the 12 miles to Nairn before they realise they've lost half of their army. You can't attack with such a small force, so they decide to turn around, come back here to Culloden in order to regroup, where they find the other half of the army. What we now have is the Jacobite army that have marched 20 miles overnight for absolutely nothing. They are understandably quite tired, freezing cold and starving. They've been on starvation rations for multiple days now. That's a biscuit per man per day. We get to the 16th of April, the next day, and it's time for our battle. The government, they wake up nice and early at 5 a.m. and they're gonna march as far west as they can from Nairn. The Jacobites, they have a bit more of a lion. They're trying to get as much sleep as they can because they are really that tired. They're gonna push as far east as they can from Culloden. Where the two armies will meet is here on Culloden Moor, a place that absolutely nobody wants to fight. What will happen is 8,000 government soldiers and 5,500 Jacobites, they will line up just over there and they will fight. We'll head down now onto the government front line, there we're going to find out all about the battle that then takes place. Okay, it's now the 16th of April, 1746, and we are stood where Barrel's regiment stood on the day. They were the left hand or southern flank of the government army, standing between these conveniently placed red flags. Up to the next flag, that would then have been Monroe's regiment. These flags, they show the width of each regiment. Now the line, it would have actually stretched up to a mile to the north of us. We can only show as far as we do because the National Trust for Scotland, we don't own the whole battlefield. We only own around a third to a half and the farmers, unsurprisingly, did not want red flags in their land. <laughs> Behind yourselves, there would have been a second line just around where the cottage is and a third all the way back at the building you can just about see. That's now a pub and a tanning salon. <laughs> Once again, we do not own the whole battlefield. <laughs> Behind me, there is a line of blue flags. Those blue flags, that is the Jacobite front line from the day. Behind them, they did also have a second line. Can we just make a wee gap here to let this gentleman through? Thank you. We get to midday and it's time for the battle to begin. The first shot will be fired by the Jacobites. They fire off one of their cannons, the cannonball, it goes flying right over our heads and lands halfway to the cottage. It's not the best start for them, but at the same time it kind of is. They have no idea what they are doing with their cannons. They've only just acquired them, they haven't had time to train, and they haven't had the spare ammunition to train with. Let alone did they bother to read the manual. So, <laughs> if we're lucky, Lindsay will go off that way, so we should be okay. Nice, Lauren. The Jacobites, they are able to get a shot off once every five minutes. On this side of the field, we have the Royal Artillery. They are one of the best artillery regiments in the world at this point, and they are able to respond once every 40 seconds. 
rather understandably I feel here the Jacobites don't like this. They send out a messenger to call for the Highland Charge, their most famous and successful tactic to date. This messenger, he will make it halfway down the line before a cannonball takes his head off, and so they have to send out another messenger. <laughs> Finally, the whole Jacobite line, they know what's happening, they just don't know when they are meant to charge. That message got lost somewhere in the confusion. The Jacobites here at the south, they are eventually going to break ranks and they are going to start charging across the field. This means that the further north you get, the further behind the Jacobites are. They see what's happening to the south of them and they sort of ripple down the line. The Jacobites up to our north, they're then going to encounter the worst of Culloden Moor. This place, it's a bog, it's a swamp, and they encounter the mud. In the good places, the Jacobites to our north, the mud, it comes up to their knees. In the bad places, it's above their hips. There's very little chance they're going to be able to run through that, let alone fight a battle, so they never actually will fight in the Battle of Culloden. The Jacobites here at the south, they do make progress across the field, and they're going to stop just about 100 metres away. They stop, they line up their muskets, they fire their muskets, and they throw them to the ground. They will then pull out whatever sharp object they've chosen for the battle, be that broadsword, be that dirk, whatever they have. They then come sprinting out of the smoke screen they've just created, screaming their lungs off, and they will crash here into Barrels and Monroe's regiments. They almost break through, but the government, they pull forward the second line, create a nice big horseshoe around where we are standing. This creates a killing field. In just two or three minutes, the 700 Jacobites who have run in here are all dead. It's pretty much a route for the Jacobites at this point, there's not much that they can do. So they will turn around and they run as fast as they can the other direction. The government horse, the cavalry, they've been stationed just around where the visitor centre is. They drop down below the brow of the hill and pop up at the Jacobite line. They are held off by some of the Jacobite regiments, but the end result is that there will be 1,500 dead uh, Jacobites in just under an hour. Uh, we're going to head over towards the Stone Cairn now. There we're going to find out what happened to those dead Jacobites. Just under an hour. And what happens now is the government from their line, they are going to push the whole way across the battlefield. The Duke, he tells them that they are to give no quarter. What that means is any Jacobite they find is to be bayoneted, shot, beaten, stabbed, basically made sure they're going to die within three days. For those three days, the whole battlefield is sealed and sentries are placed around it. They are told anyone coming in, anyone going out is to be shot on sight. Once those three days are up, the government, they march down to Inverness, rally all of the people up, and march them back up here to Culloden. They then say, you must deal with the dead. So that is what the people of Inverness are going to do. They dig mass graves of 150 to 200 and place the dead Jacobites into them. These grassy mounds we see either side of us here, those are the mass graves that were dug back in 1746. We skip forward now 135 years to 1881 and a man called Duncan Forbes. He was the Laird of Culloden, so the Lord of the land we are standing on. He decides in his most romantic Victorian splendour, he would like to commemorate the battle that took place here. So he will pay a handsome sum of money for the cairn to be erected and for gravestones to be put in at the burial sites. Now, back in 1746, there was no such thing as Clan Tartan. That comes later with the Victorians. Instead, at this time, Tartan was just dyed with whatever dyes you had, what was local, natural, whatever you could afford to buy. The people buried here as well, they would not all have been wearing Tartan. This was a European Jacobite army. A lot of them don't even know what Tartan is by the time they come here. A lot of them will not wear it. The people buried here as well, they're pretty much buried at random. The people of Inverness doing the burying, they don't know who they are burying, they basically just place them wherever there is space for them. Back in 1881, therefore, Duncan Forbes, he was very unlikely he was going to be able to know who was buried in what grave. So the gravestones, they're a nice marker for some of the people who did fight here, but please do take their placement with a pinch of salt. We are going to head down that way now for the tour. We're going to find out about the government dead over there. You're more than welcome to come back up here to the gravesite in your own time once the tour is over. Firstly, Field of the English. <coughs> what English do they mean? There's no English army that fight here at the Battle of Culloden. This is a British civil war. What we have is the government who are fighting for the Hanoverian kings and the Jacobites who are fighting for the Stuart kings. 
The government army, they weren't just English. There was also Scotsmen, there was Irishmen, there were Welshmen, and there were Germans all fighting here oh, as well. By some estimates, there were actually more Scots fighting for the government than the Jacobites here at Cologne. Some suggest that around a third of our 8,000 government soldiers were Scottish, so there was more on this side. They were buried here. No, they weren't. We've surveyed the field behind us, there's absolutely nothing there. What we have found just over there behind that red flag is another small burial mound, just 75 to 100 bodies in it. The official government death toll for the Battle of Culloden was 50. It was probably more likely a few hundred, but history is written by the victors and so 50 is the number that we have. In the topsoil of that mound, we found a small coin. That coin, you can see it inside the museum, it's a 12th of a thaler, a Hanoverian coin dated to 1752, six years after the battle. What we think has happened here is a Hanoverian, they've come back to either the place where they fought or lost a loved one, knew where they were buried and they've left a coin as their way of remembering the dead. It's either that or they had a hole in their pocket, but cool, I like the other story. You may well have noticed the cow that came walking up to us there, if you were looking. That's part of our conservation grazing team. We have Highland cow, Shetland cow, uh, some primitive goats and some ponies. Their job is to keep the battlefield looking how it looked back in 1746. This was common grazing land, so we thought what better way to look after the land than to have our own grazing stock. That's why we have them. They're also very good for photos. <laughs> We're going to head over to the cottage. There we'll find out all about the aftermath. A very similar cottage would have been here back in 1746. People kept living in it all the way up until the start of the 1900s though, and then in the 1930s it burnt down. And so this is the cottage that we now see. The cottage back in 1746, it was used by the government as a field hospital. Basically any wounded troop that would have been brought through here, given the most basic of medical treatment and then either somehow made it off the battlefield or perhaps been buried in our government grave. What happened to the two princes though? We have the Duke of Cumberland and Charles Edward Stuart. Things are going well for the Duke. He's won at the battle. He will then begin the pacification of the Highlands. He spends several months up here going around, burning people's houses down, ensuring there's never another Jacobite rising. He will then head down back to London. He's given a hero's welcome and a massive increase in his military pension. He quite likes being a soldier, so he heads off to Germany where Britain and France are still at war. And he is going to lose to the French there. He's fighting in Hanover, his ancestral homeland, when he loses and accidentally surrenders the land of Hanover to them. His dad, as the elector, is not very happy with him. The king will therefore disown the Duke of Cumberland. The Duke, he lives the rest of his life in relative anonymity, dying in just 1765, only about 20 years after the battle here at Culloden. Things aren't going so well for Charles. He's obviously lost here at the battle, and by some accounts he is dragged from the field. He will then spend several months on the run in Scotland. He's trying to rally support for his rising, but it's just not going to come for him. He will then escape over the sea to Skye, back out to the Western Isles, and back to France. He spends two years in France before the French get really sick of him and kick him out, and he'll then live the rest of his life in Italy. It's in Italy that he develops his reputation as an alcoholic and a womanizer. He's going to die in 1788, a fair while after the battle, but his wife will have left him, and he's got a big old barbell left to pay. Things are once again even worse here in the Highlands of Scotland. We've already had the pacification, and then in August 1746, the Act of Prescription is passed. This act, it basically outlaws a lot of Highland culture. Men and boys, they weren't allowed to do things like wear their tartans and kilts, speak the Gaelic language, gather in large groups, carry weapons of war. That was deliberately vague, it could mean anything from a musket and a broadsword, perhaps into silly things like a set of bagpipes. Depends on who was enforcing the law here. That did only apply to men and boys, women and girls. They weren't seen as a threat by Parliament, so they were allowed to continue doing whatever they liked. <laughs> <laughs> the only way for men and boys to get around the act of prescription was by joining the British Army. A lot would do just that. They would serve in the growing British Empire, places like Canada, the East Coast of America, and the Caribbean. Here they discover there's a whole lot of land and even more opportunity to go with it. So when they return to Scotland and we get the clearances of the following century, a lot of Scottish families decide to emigrate for good. What we have therefore 
It's the Battle of Culloden really symbolising the beginning of the end of the clan system that had been the way of life for centuries. Instead, what we now have is what's called a Scottish diaspora. People from Scotland spread all over the world, harking back to this one culture that doesn't even really exist anymore. We're going to head back to the visitor centre where we have just one last stop before I let you get on with your day. There we go. <laughs> okay, folks, so back in 2007, when the National Trust for Scotland were building our nice new visitor centre, we decided we wanted our own way to commemorate those who died in the battle. So we built the wall we see here. On that side, the stone sticking out the wall. And down there, there's some stones sticking out the wall. There's then a gap here. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Up on that side, there's 1,500 stones. There, there's 50 stones. This represents the 1,500 Jacobites and 50 government soldiers who died at the battle. It shows the proportional difference between the two. The stones, they're random. They're just our way of showing each individual person. There's no names, clan crests, that sort of thing. You remember I said earlier how the National Trust for Scotland only own around a third to a half of the battlefield? Well, we'd love to continue looking after the bit we do have as best we possibly can. And the best way for people like yourselves to help with that is to do little things like donations and memberships to the National Trust for Scotland. Even just heading inside, going to the gift shop, going to the cafe, they really do make a big difference. So, it's what we're thinking about. <laughs> That's everything I have to say though, so thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Well, we sure hope you enjoy this little foray into history lesson in Scotland about the Culloden uh, battlefield and the Jacobites. So thanks again for coming along for the ride as down the road we go.